wonderful. It seems to me that the, the Archie Gray Owl didn't get the recognition he deserved when, when he was alive. Is that the case? And if you can tell us a little what made him important. Well, he was ahead of his time in many respects. He was a conservationist. But he started his life as a trapper. He started his life here in the wilderness of northern Ontario. And he was a man who reinvented himself. He was a man who was running away from himself. He was a man who wanted to be an Indian. He was, he dreamt of being an Indian since he was a young boy. He left Hastings at the age of 17 and headed off to Canada and got involved with being an Indian. And it was really one of those situations where it caught up with him. He got in so deep that he couldn't stop being an Indian. And then, of course, he, he'd had many wives. And he met this young woman called Anna Hario, Pony. She was a Mohawk, Iroquois. And I think that was the person that really turned his life around. He started writing. He started putting down on paper his stories. And they got printed in journals, Country Life, back in England. And suddenly he had a following. Then he wrote books. And then, of course, by that time, he became this incredible Indian speaking from the wilderness, this savage, this noble. And Archie being Archie, he was, he was an actor at heart. You want to know why I was fascinated by Grey Owl and how it came into my life? Well, after I did GoldenEye, the first James Bond movie, um, I was sent a script called Grey Owl. And I'd never heard of this man, didn't know who he was, where he came from, what he was about. It was just called Grey Owl. I read the script, and I loved the script. Uh, I loved Richard Attenborough's work. And it was a firm offer. I remember my agent, I phoned the next day, and I said, listen, I'll read for this. I'll screen test for this, whatever it takes. And he said, listen. I said, listen, I'll do anything. He said, listen. He said, the job is yours. And I went, oh, how wonderful. How wonderful is that? You mean he's offering me the role? And uh, that's how it happened. And that was about three years ago. And I said yes to the role. And I didn't know that Richard, Lord Attenborough, and Jake Abbotts hadn't really set up their financial structure, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it, um, it kind of fell apart. And it went away. And I was very saddened that it went away. And then a year went by, I'd done another picture, and the phone rang one morning, and it was Richard saying, I'm ready to go. And I said, oh, my heavens. Oh, the timing is not good here, Richard, because I've got the next James Bond movie to do, and you know those movies are, are big. They're, they're very time consuming. And the second Bond was just as important, if not more important, and more taxing than doing the first one. And I said, I don't think I have the stamina to do this. I don't think I, I'll be doing you and the memory of Archie Gray Owl and myself a disservice if I try and slot it in here. And I'm going to have to pass. And I put the phone down. I went, oh my god. I turned the job down. And it went away. Second time. I did the next James Bond movie. The phone rang again. And it was Richard saying, I'm ready to go. Are you ready? And I said, I'm ready. And here we are. Uh, the world is hurting. This earth of ours is really hurting. It's, uh, it's hemorrhaging. And it sounds dramatic, but nevertheless, it is. Um, the pollution, global warming, uh, shameful neglect to our forests and to our oceans. And if we deplete those, we have no recourse. We don't, we, you know, right now, this time, going into the next you know, millennium, we have to pay attention. So a role like this, for me, as a person, as a, as a, as a father, as a, as, a, as a man, and as an actor, is a, you know, it's just one of those wonderful roles where you get to go out there and portray a fascinating character who works on many different levels. But ultimately, does it have a message? Yes, and that is take care of this Earth, protect, preserve, the Earth needs CPR. Um, but that's the message. I mean, the, the film is a romantic. It's, 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 a, it's a love story. It's about this incredible man who says that he was an Indian, and then on his deathbed, 
they found out he wasn't an Indian. And to go back to your earlier question, yes, I mean, he was disgraced, he was humiliated, the memory of him in, in his death, they just tore him apart. And then it wasn't until the late 70s that the younger generation found this character and began to bring him out of his uh, seclusion and hold up to the world what, a, what an amazing man he was. He was, he was a great man. Uh, he was flawed. He was, he was many things. But his voice at the end of his days was about take care of the forests, take care of the animals, take care of the earth. I haven't really felt any negativity since playing James Bond. I've just relished every moment of it. Moment of it. Um, <clears throat> I love the role of James Bond. It's a great character. I grew up with, uh, with seeing the movies. Um, I feel very proud of the work that I've done in the last two movies. Seems to be getting better, figuring out what I'm doing with the role. And when you have a role like that which is loved and which has been passed on from generation to generation, and you have the good success that I've had with it, then that allows you a certain, it allows you choices. Um, And I suppose, you know, I started as an actor and I wanted to be a movie star, and now I'm a movie star, I want to be an actor. So <laughs> I'm just having a ball. I'm having a good old time. And, uh, you know, again, to work with someone like Richard, who, whose work speaks for itself as an actor, and as a director, as a producer, as a humanitarian, it's a joy. It's an absolute joy. I was trained as an actor to be able to do everything. And of course, you come out of your drama school and out of your training thinking that you can do everything and anything, and then you begin to find your limitations, or people put limitations on you. And so it's a constant fight to uh, find material that will stretch you, and to work with people that will stretch you, and work with the best people. Sometimes you can find really good material, but be working with klutzes who really don't have the articulation of talent to bring it out in you. Um, you know, Bond is, is over there now. I've got two more to do. And the work that I choose in between the movies is really important to me. Um, to grow as an actor, to stretch. And, well, nothing comes from nothing. You have to work. As an actor, you have to work. And sometimes you find it hard to, to get the work. But, uh, and there have been times when I just worked. I had to pay the rent. So you say, okay, this is half decent, I'll do it. Because, because you have to survive. And then you get a bit of success, and then you have maybe a choice of this job or that job, and that's a luxury. And then you get to a certain point in life where you have maybe many choices, and then that you know, that can get confusing, and then you can kind of get stunted by trying to make the right choice and, you know, the fear of failure and everything. So it's, you know, it's a constant tug of war, really. But um, I love being an actor, and it's, it's my life. It's what's brought me down the road so far. And, You know, this is, this is just one of many roles. I've done other roles which have just have been different as well, but they haven't been seen by people. But you work with someone like with Richard Attenborough with a text by William Nicholson, which is a wonderful story, and you hope that it will be seen by many people, and for all the reasons that I've just spoken of. This is Doubtfire because at that point, I was doing cable movies and the odd independent here and there, and I'd never done a studio film, and Mrs. Doubtfire came along, and it was a, a great opportunity to work with, you know, Robin Williams and Sally Field. Chris Columbus directed it, and I'd never worked in a studio system before, and the film was a great success, and suddenly, and I felt very at home, I felt very at ease in it, and it was comedy, and it was parroting the persona of who I am and how I'm perceived as a leading man or 
the guy who gets the girl. And it's a great film. I you know, think. for me, it just gave me the confidence and that kind of wonderful, yes, got in there, got it. And, and I said to my agents, I said, look, you know, forget about the leading man stuff. I just want to be, you know, just good character work. If it's, you know, two scenes with a great director and a good script, I want to be there. Don't censor me for anything. Just don't think of me for, you know, the leading man, whatever, whatever. That's rubbish. I'm an actor. I need to work, and I need to get out there and uh, do it, because otherwise I'll just be locked away. And so that was a turning point, and people go, oh, how fascinating, how wonderful. You're fun, you're this. You're... And then I got another role, and then another role, and... And then the bond came along. Family, work. Um, work right now is very important. My, my, my family life, every, all the children are on track all at the same time, which is great. And um, professionally, it's, uh, it couldn't be better. I have my own company. Uh, I've made a film, produced a, a film in Ireland, and um, we're trying to get that up be seen and be distributed, come out this year. I have another picture with my company, which we're going to do right after this. And then there's the next James Bond. So suddenly you have work lined up, which kind of can be a bit frightening, because then you feel like you're trapped. <laughs> a great woman did this. Her name is Sheila Stotts. She lives in Los Angeles, and she's been doing this for many, many years. And, you know, braids is something which I've never worn before. And be it that Richard and I have wanted to do this firm, and there were like two false starts, or might have been, and then suddenly we were off and we're running, and then it's, oh my God, I gotta wear braids, you know? I mean, I'd read, I'd done all the research, but <laughs> believe it or not, I hadn't actually thought about putting the braids in. So I thought it would be a good idea to um, go ahead and live with them for a while. So about, you know, four or five weeks before the film, I had them put in, and I lived with them, and. You know, I learned how to live with long hair and put them in plaits, and braids, and uh, there you have it. It's like living with an animal on your head, really. You know, it's a pain in the neck at times, literally a pain in the neck because you've got lots of hair. But it does mean that you don't have to get, you know, get up so early in the morning and sit in the makeup trailer and spend 45 minutes putting them in and 45 minutes taking them out at the end of the day when you want to go have a beer. So, works on two levels thinking all the time.